Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and m and Bank, Geneva Burns, Jean Tomasi and Webster, Capital One Bank, the Wickoff Group, New York Community Bank, Greenberg Trorug, Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from Aerial Property Advisors, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CVRE, Colliers International NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, CUNY TV Foundation, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, First Nationwide Title Insurance Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Herrick Feinstein, Versha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman, USRealty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Newmark Grubnight Frank, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, Urban American, and these friends. Radio, radio, 93 million people listen to radio. So kids grow up in Brooklyn. They, they, they decide to get involved with radio. They get involved with TV, and they, they don't get involved. They've been involved. I mean, the executive vice president of all production for CBS Radio, 1010 wins, it's 880. I got the legendary Scott Herman. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Michael. Tell me about your, your grandparents, you know? how they arrived here and a little history about them. Well, my mother's parents, my, my grandfather came from Russia, um, came over, his name was Weiskowitz, so they told him you're Weiss because they didn't want to write the full name out at Ellis Island. It was easier, sure. Much easier. My grandmother came from Poland and they were married over 75 years, um, lived in Brighton Beach. That was Herman, right? That was, that was the Weiss side. That's my mother's side. Okay. My father's side, they were born here, both my grandparents. But the ancestry goes back to also Russia and Poland, but they were both born here. Now, where'd they grow up? In Brooklyn or the Bronx? I mean... My grandfather grew up in the Bronx. My grandmother grew up in New Hampshire and then made her way to New York. And they actually met in the Bronx. So the transplants. Now, the so how did they... Okay. How they arrive in Brooklyn? My grandfather owned a hardware store with his sister in the Bronx, and they somehow made the decision that the future of the hardware store should be in Brooklyn. Now, the interesting thing is the hardware store was in Brighton, which today is heavily Russian, and uh, that was called Herman's. Herman's Hardware. We have, we have a photo of Herman's Hardware, and you know, Later on, you know, there's even a picture of you, you in Herman's Hardware. He has a little boy in the hardware store. A little hardware store. So we were talking about how your mother met your dad. Now, people don't know about candy stores. Candy stores were, were, were like, that was the place. You know, you got your egg cream, you got your soda, you got your cherry Coke. You Breakfast, got news, your newspaper, newspaper, your magazine, your right, comic books. Right, and you were able to, you know, and sometimes if you worked in that place, you might have the opportunity to put the papers together. So if you worked the papers together, you also had the opportunity uh, to maybe get some free food. So how does your mother meet your father? My father was 17, having an egg cream, which to this day is one of his favorite drinks still. With my, Fox's You Bet? Fox's You Bet. And my mother was 14 on the payphone, talking to her mother, 
My father looks over, catches her eye. You remember payphones. Payphone. My father looks over, catches her eye, and that was it. He fell in love. So the 14 and the 17-year-old, and when did they get married? They got married, I think my father was, my mother was 18, and my father was 21. So they get married. They're living in Brooklyn, in Brighton. Mm-hmm. And your father goes to work for his his father in Herman's? Yeah, my father had two <clears throat> brothers. The three of them all worked in the hardware store. My father was the oldest, and he was the one that couldn't get along with my grandfather because he had ideas for the business. My grandfather had other ideas. Your father goes into the business over there, initially in the hardware store on Brighton Fifth Street. Mm -hmm. And your, you, where the, your parents are living at that time, what? In Brighton or? Actually, they lived on Brighton Fifth Street. The hardware store at that point, because we moved the store a few years later, the original store in Brighton Beach was between Brighton 2nd and Brighton 3rd. And then we moved to a bigger store on the corner of Brighton 2nd. I remember to this day, people would come into the store to try to cash a check. And my grandfather would always say, I have a deal with Lincoln Savings Bank. I don't cash checks, they don't sell paint. <laughs> right, and Lincoln Savings Bank was the big, on the corner over there on... On, uh, on Coney Island Avenue, Brighton Beach Avenue. Across the street from Mrs. Stalls, right. in Ish. And so, up the block from Brighton Beach Baths. Correct, which is now the Oceana, uh, which was Brighton Beach Baths. So now you're born, were, you, were your parents living when you were born? I think we were, I think they moved to a bigger apartment when I was born. I think I was born on the Brighton, on the Brighton address, and the earliest apartment I remember living in was Avenue Z and East 13th Street. So you're living on Avenue Z and East 13th Street. Uh, so tell to me about growing up uh, in Brooklyn, the oh, early it years. It was wonderful. All I remember is you played outside all day. There were kids everywhere. You played stoop ball, you played punch ball, you played kick ball, you played stick ball. You played all day long, and then when your parents yelled from the window, you went upstairs. Right, and the windows, you know, the, the fire escapes were the terraces. Right. Right, the, these were the interesting times of Brooklyn. Tell me about some of the jobs that you did. You, you worked, I know you worked in the hardware store. I worked in the hardware store almost from age 10 on, every Saturday morning. My uncle would pick me up. We would go for breakfast at Dubrow's on Kings Highway. Dubrow's. Dubrow's. And then we'd go to Brighton Beach, and I'd work a 10-hour work day. And I'd make my $10 for the day. And I'd wait on customers and do all the stuff that you'd normally and, do. And you knew where the Farberware coffee pots were? and the, Everything. Uh, right. like Corningware, Pyrex, Rubbermaid, plumbing supplies, keys. And the carts. The you car right. We had no room for carts. No, 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 I know, but the carts for the customers. The shopping carts. The shopping carts. Oh, yes. We put new wheels on shopping carts. We did all this stuff. Sold them screens for their faucets, fixed their aerators. We did it all. Now, so you go to public school where? The first yes. school I went to was PS 209 on Avenue Z and Coney Island Avenue. Then we moved. I went to PS 153 on Homecrest Avenue for one year. And then PS 255 um, for fifth and sixth grade, which was 17th between R and S. And then you go to Cunningham. You, mm -hmm. Which was across the street from the elementary school. Right. You've, your dad really possibly brought you into the spectrum of the media because he was involved uh, as a part-time photographer, right? Yeah, early in his life when he really made the decision not to be in the hardware business, even when he was in the hardware store, he'd run out and chase fire engines. And in those days, he knew every cop in Coney Island, Brighton Beach, that whole area. They all knew him. And he took pictures for the, the Brooklyn Daily, the Daily Mirror, the Journal American, he worked for all these newspapers and eventually did some work for the Associated Press for many years. But he needed a real job. He needed a full-time job to make money. So he went into life insurance. Life insurance. So now that's interesting because that was the change to Cunningham, uh, which put you, you went into, you, your parents always rented apartments. And then they, they rented an apartment in a three-family, three as they would right. say. So right. So it's like a private house, but we didn't own it. Right. So on the third f floor was the Hermans. Right. We lived up there. The second floor was another tenant. They were the people that owned it. Oh, they were the owner. Okay. Right. The Natters, they owned it. And then the first floor was the entrepreneurial uh, insurance office of that. Exactly. Okay. Over there. And right next door was a grocery store. I delivered groceries and one of those big bikes with the big baskets. 
and delivered groceries in the area during the week and then worked at the hardware store on Saturdays. Then you go to Madison. I mean, even though I'm a Lincoln boy and your parents went to Lincoln, you go to Madison and you graduate from Madison and th there's a decision. Which college do you go to? It was a rather simple decision, right? Yes, it was Brooklyn College or Kingsboro. It was four years or two years. There was no, it's not like it is today. You know, I live in New Jersey and the parents are always, oh, my kid got into these five schools, applied to these 12 schools. It wasn't like that. I mean, we didn't, we didn't even think about it. Nobody had money to go away and it wasn't a priority to go away. I, I, we had one, I had one friend in my class, I remember, who got into Penn, but we didn't even know Penn was a good school because we never heard of these schools. And he went to University of Pennsylvania. It was until years later, I said, boy, David was pretty smart. He got into Penn. So you, you, so you take Brooklyn College, and as you said to me, the first semester at Brooklyn College was not the best time for you, right? No, it was hard because I, I had a class at 9 a.m. and then another class at 3 p.m. And time in between, and it was hard, and it was, I just didn't like it. I went in as a psychology major, and my father did not go to college. And he begged me to stay in school. Now, your mother did go to college. My mother went early on and then had kids, and she stopped, wound up going back later on in life. We'll talk about that later. But um, he begged me to stay. He said, join a club, do something to stay in school. You'll enjoy it more. And I went to the college newspaper, the Kingsman, because I was on the high school newspaper staff. And I just didn't get the vibe. I didn't, I didn't like it. It didn't strike me as being the place I wanted to be. But... You know, I, I failed to bring up, but when you were in high school and your relationship with Grandpa Herman and your other grandfather, uh, you used to sit on a steamer, uh, a, tr a, a trunk, right? And yeah. try to do baseball reporting, right? Well, in the, in the old days, you know, when you went away to camp or the Army, I guess you had this big trunk. You went with, Now they all use duffel bags. But I had this trunk that I would turn upside down to make my desk, and I would sit there with my tape recorder, with the Met game on, with the sound off, and I would do the play-by-play -play for the Met games. But that was in high school, right? That was even before that. That was high school, junior high school. I did it. In, I think I did it starting in fifth grade. So you never. Re so this was really your media involvement. You know? I didn't. I didn't. You know didn't it realize then. it was media involvement. No, but years later, I, I look back and I go, "That was my." When people ask me, "When did you get your bug for radio?" I can really trace it back to sitting in the at the trunk and doing the play-by-play -play for the Mets. Right, but you know, if you really go back, when the Dodgers and the, the Giants moved out to California, they, they were simulated uh, baseball. You know, they said, they read it over the, there was a hit or something like that, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. So, the Kingsman, you see this? Uh, and it wasn't, the newspaper wasn't for me in college, and I see a poster for WBCR, Brooklyn College Radio. I didn't even know the school had a radio station. So I walk in, and I talk to, I don't even remember who I talked to at that point. And um, they said, what are you interested in? I said, sports. I love sports. Sports editor of the high school paper. Played baseball most of my life. He says, well, go, well, go do an audition. They take me to the back. I do an audition. They said, okay, you have Mondays at 4.30 p.m. For one minute. One minute. 60 seconds of sports, Mondays at 4.30. Which relates. You, know, you give me 22 minutes, I'll give you the news, right? <laughs> so one minute. I took all day writing that one minute. I wrote it. I rewrote it. I wrote it again. I wrote it again. I mean, it was, it had to be the most perfect 60 seconds of my life. And I loved it. I, I looked forward all week to that one sports cast. I just fell in love. So what happens next? You, you, you're looking for a job or something? You, you, well, you, I, you I, have a mentor, I right? had a life-changing moment in that I switched my major from psychology to TV and radio. And I had a class... Sp TV, radio, speech, and writing with Sister Camille Darienza. Right over there, our friend, Sister Camille. Sister Camille, who was a religion commentator on 1010 Win. She still is. She's been there over 40 years. But she was my professor for this class, and it was probably the first A I ever got in school. And I remember for her class, one of the projects was you had to do an on-scene report. And I did... The fact that it was raining on election day, which hampered the turnout for elections. And she loved it. She said to me, I interviewed people that, that were voting, why'd they go out in the rain? She loved it. She said to me, you should do this for a living. And I said, are you going to help me? She said, come back in your junior year. And like Tuesdays with Maury in, in his book, 
it was like Thursdays with Sister Camille. I would go to her office all the time and hang out with her and talk to her. And she recommended me to 1010 Wins in my junior year of college for an internship. And when I went in for the interview, the news director saw my resume. And at that point, I was general manager of the college radio station. And he says to me, you're running your radio? I said, yeah. He says, you know how to edit? I said, yes. He says, have you done news interviews? I said, yes. He goes, do you want an internship or a job? I said, I'd love a job. He said, $3.85 an hour. On the short hours, what, 4 o'clock in the morning? 4 o'clock in the morning till noon on Saturdays, which destroyed my Friday nights, because um, I'd be at work at 4, um, as a news production assistant. And that was my start in the business. And then you also work Sundays also. Well, uh, four weeks into the job, they liked me so much. Fred Hornby was the historic morning editor at Wins. And Fred worked with me on Saturday and told the news director that I was wonderful and he should give me the other day on Sunday. So I went to school Monday to Friday and worked Saturday and Sundays at Wins. And then you graduate? They actually held a job for me. A, job, a full-time job became available in my senior year. And they asked me if I wanted it. And I knew if I had taken the job and quit school, I'd never go back to school. And I had made that commitment to my father to finish school. So I said, um, I need to finish college. They held the job for me. And what was that job? It was a full-time news production assistant working 11 at night till 7 in the morning. Now, this is when you get married also, right? Well, I graduated, I graduated in June of 80. I started working full-time the next day after graduation got engaged four months later, and got married 14 months later. Right. The great thing that helped you at WINS was the, the, the strike, right? There was a strike in 1982. The Afterns, the After Union, went on strike. And the Writers Guild went out in sympathy of the Afterns. And they looked at me and they said, I was a manager at that point. They created a management job for me called right. unit manager. So you were out of the union. So I could work for the strike. They were preparing that they wanted me to work during the strike. And but I, you, had a, you had a job as an administrator, buying pencils or whatever this. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I made sure the cars were registered. They were gassed up. They got right, oil changes. Press uh, per credentials and everything, right. But I, I parlayed that job into, this. into an editorial management job. And when the strike hit... I kept the station, not me personally, but I kept the station on the air because I was the only person who knew the formatics and how the station worked. So Westinghouse, who owned the station at the time, brought managers in from every station we had, radio and TV. And I was the guy that trained them on the format, on how we did things. And the station sounded very good during the strike. They didn't know what they were doing, the people, but they had great voices. And I was the one that was charged with making sure it sounded like wins. So after the strike, you get promoted. They promote me to assistant news director, and it was wonderful. I mean, I, I assigned the reporters. I did all that. I know Stan Brooks was on your show in the past. He passed away recently, but, but Stan took me under his wing. And now, again, I'm, I, I was assistant news director of Winds, and I was 24 years old, now a kid. Now you spend a couple of years at Wins, and then then somebody calls you up at Group W, the Westinghouse Bros, and they said Philadelphia. You had, you didn't even know what Philadelphia was. I had never been out of New York because I went to school in Brooklyn, lived in Brooklyn. You know, we moved to Manhattan shortly after I started at Brooklyn College. I did the reverse commute back to Brooklyn, but never lived out of New York. Never really went away anywhere. So Philadelphia. What happens? I, thought, I didn't realize it was only an hour and a half down the turnpike. Philadelphia, to me, could have been 10 hours away. But that was the first time I kind of had my own newsroom that I was responsible for. And um, I loved it. I loved every minute of it. So from Philly, where do you go next? Well, then Westinghouse bought a Chicago radio station from NBC. NBC was getting out of the radio business at that point. And we bought WMAQ 670. It had gone from a country station to a talk station, and then we were going to make it an all-news station, like a 1010 wins. Which is perfect, uh, which was your expertise. Right up my alley. Right, and then, which is one of the other pictures, when you're in Kaminsky in Chicago, you get back on the field and you, you throw a pitch with your son over there. Yeah, that was a highlight. We, we carried the White Sox on WMAQ. So we were an all-news station, but we carried the White Sox. And uh, they had WMAQ night. So I went to throw out the first pitch at the game, and I remember... Um, Steve Lyons 
caught the first pitch for the White Sox. And he comes up to the mound to hand me the ball, and my then three-year-old son was with me on the mound. Now he's 28 and gave me a granddaughter recently. Um, I'm standing there. He brings me the ball, and he goes, Normie from Cheers threw the ball last night and threw it over my head. Don't screw it up. And now I'm really nervous. I'm standing on the mound at Comiskey right. Park. I threw a strike. So you spend a little time in Chicago, a couple of years in Chicago. A couple of years. And then, then, then you go to L.A.? I go back, back to, to Philly, Philly to television. Right. You go over in Philly over there, your radio and television, right? Yeah, they, they, they brought me in as a television news director for the NBC affiliate. You see, these are cameras. I realize you, <laughs> you know microphones. It's been a long time. Right. And um, I do TV for about a year and a half, and then they have this idea. Since I now know TV, and I was so good in radio, why not put radio and television under me? So now I'm running the all-news radio station and the television news department, and I'm the director of news programming for the building, basically. I had a great time. It was wonderful. Then it's Southern California? No. no then I, back to Winds. Back to Winds, right. So I meet the, the president of Group W Radio at the time, Dan Mason, who ironically is my boss today. He left and came back. He's the CEO of, group, of CBS Radio today. Uh, Dan comes to meet me in Philadelphia and says, would you like to come back to radio full time? And I thought he was talking about being news director. And I said, Dan, I'm past being news director of a radio station. I'm a television news director now. Uh, you know, I've hit the big time. Right. And he says, no, 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 to be general manager of 1010 Wins. And, and you got to understand, to go from 385 an hour at 1010 Wins to being the general manager is as close as you're ever going to come. Right, but you, you also elevated from 90 Park Avenue to 888 7th Avenue, right? Fancy new digs. Right. And I, I but said, the general manager at Wins at what age? I was, let's see, that's 1993. I was 35. 35 years of age. Which at that point was pretty young for a general manager of that size station. Because Wins was the biggest radio station in the chain. And at that time, uh, you were competing with 880 because it was separate. Right, we're separate companies. Right, so you were competing with uh, CBS News. Right. We owned... Westinghouse owned 1010 Winds and WNEW-FM, 102.7. CBS owned 880 and 101.1, WCBS-FM. And then a few years later, Westinghouse bought CBS. So you're the general manager of Winds for how many years? Ten. Ten years, and then you have an opportunity to go out to California, right? No, I stayed here. Oh, wait, okay. I mean, my California trips were just to help stations on the West Coast, but I was never full-time okay. on the West Coast. So you're at Wins for these 10 years. And they always gave me second jobs. So I ran Wins and I ran WNEWFM. I ran Wins and I ran the CBS radio network for a year. Then I got NEWFM back again. So right. I kept having different second jobs. Right, but you also were involved with some major changes like the fan. I mean, this is, talk about how that was created. Well, I mean, Fan was originally owned by a company called Emmis, a guy run by a guy named Jeff Smullyan. And then Fan was bought by Infinity. And then... And Infinity, who owned... Infinity was then bought by CBS. So now, when we buy Infinity, Mel Karmazin comes in as the head of CBS Radio. And now we own six stations in New York. Because in addition to Winds in 880 and 1027 and 101.1... Now we own 92.3 K-Rock, so Howard Stern comes into our company, and we also own WFAN on 660 AM. So now this is when the, the world of radio and TV are changing because now you're allowed to own more stations right. in a market, the era of consolidation. So now we own six radio stations and Channel 2 in New York. Now it's a big company here in New York. When do you join CBS, I mean, whichever entity, because there were so many... When you leave, uh, you left Wins when? I left Wins in 2003. My buddy Joel Hollander was the general manager of Fan in the Infinity days. I was the GM of Wins in the Westinghouse days. And we were two guys, he was from the Bronx, I was from Brooklyn, running big AM radio stations. So we became friendly. Actually, one of our clients, Helene Naiman, put us together, said, you guys... You guys would get along great. You got to meet each other. Helene put us together. We become very good friends. Joel then leaves the company after we become one. Joel leaves the company to run Westwood One, which was a network syndication company. 
and then comes back to CBS to be the CEO of CBS Radio. And Joel calls me and says, look, I'm going to corporate. It hasn't been announced yet. Do you want to go to corporate with me? Now I have a big decision to make because leaving Wins, which was the best job in the world, was hard for me. It's like being captain of a ship. Right. And I remembered one of my old bosses telling me, you'll have bigger jobs in your life, but you won't have a better job, which is very true. But it was a bigger job. And Joel was a corporate, so I went. And I went to become executive vice president of the Eastern Region. So there were five of us that divvied up the country, and I kind of handled the Northeast. How many stations did you have? It was about 40 at the time. I think it was six markets, 40 stations. Is kind of what I had under me. And then several years later, Dan Mason, that original guy that made me GM of wins in 93, comes back to the company as the CEO of CBS Radio and decides he doesn't like this model with five people divvying up the country. He reorganizes and says, it's going to be me and you. And that's the way it's been for the last so your role eight years. And your role today is what? I'm the executive vice president of operations. So basically, every one of our cities, we're in 26 cities. Every city has a general manager. We call them the market manager that runs all the stations in that city. What is it? How many stations in total? 126. And 17 of the markets come under me, and nine come under Dan. But we both deal with all of the markets at any given time. Right, and then it's radio.com where you have all the opportunities to listen to every. On the stream, radio.com is our digital effort. It's it's a one. It's almost like a mall. It's a mall of all of our radio stations to listen to whenever you're on the road, anywhere you are in America. You can go to radio.com, listen to any of our stations. So let's talk a bit about the family. Later on in your in your mother's life, she goes back to medical school. Well, she went back to Brooklyn College to get her degree. Then she decides she wants to be a doctor. Now she can't get into an American medical school because at her age she wasn't going to get in. So she applies in Mexico. So now she goes to the Berlitz School to learn Spanish and then goes to medical school in Tampico. And we actually had to get married in December because we had to get married during my mom's Christmas break from school. <laughs> okay. So that's mom. Mom and dad are living on the Upper East Side. You met your wife in homeroom, right? Seventh grade homeroom at Cunningham. My recollection is I was in row five, seat one. She was in row six, seat one. I fell in love the first time I saw her. It took her about 20 years later, but I fell in love the first time I saw and her. Let's talk about the children. Tell me about them. We have three kids. You're Our wrong. oldest. His name? Sean. He's 28. Um, he's married to Naomi. They have a grand, I have a granddaughter, their daughter, Skylar Fay, um, who's three months old. And Sean's in the IT business. Naomi's a social worker. Uh, my daughter is the middle child, Jamie. Uh, she's 25, a school teacher, first grade teacher in Pennsylvania, married to TJ, who works in the banking business. And they gave me my first grandchild, my grandson. So you got two. Kai. Okay. I have two. Kai Liam. He's six months old. And my youngest, Gregory, is the tallest Herman on record. We've gone back how tall? centuries. He's six feet tall. It's like my son, David, who's like 6'4". We have no idea how he came We from. don't know where his height came from, but Greg is graduating this year from Washington U in St. Louis. That's right. So it's, it's really great to always have a, a Brooklyn boy, a guy who went to Brooklyn College, you know, who understands everything in, about the city and who's been a great leader in the, in the field of uh, radio. And thanks for being here today. Thank you so much.